Would you stand? Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Would you stand as you are willing and able? And Kelly is going to give us a little guidance through 188. But the words are in the order of service, so that should make it a little easier. Okay, sorry. We're all going to sing it one time through, and then we'll yes, do it in I invited a round. Him. Yeah. And we'll start with this side. So we have more people on this side, huh? Uh, but we will make up for it on yes, this side. Yes, we will. Good job, everyone. And good morning. good morning. And welcome to the Universalist Unitarian Church of Farmington. My name is Kevin Smith, and I'm currently serving as your VP of Finance on the Executive Board. Now, I'd like to extend a special welcome to any visitors that we have here today. Please join us in the lower level after service for coffee hour. Newcomers may enjoy introductory conversations downstairs at the welcome table with some of our members. It's deja vu all over again. <laughs> During the service, we have supervised nursery for babies and toddlers and religious education classes for children and youth. Please see our religious education coordinator, Natalie Case, for more information. There's Natalie. And should you need to leave the service for any reason, there are two other locations in the building where the service is broadcast. An usher can direct you to those sites. Now, our UU principles begin with our pledge to affirm and promote the inherent worth and dignity of all people. As we are a welcoming congregation, we welcome into our community people of all races, sexual orientations, belief systems, and ages, including any who are fidgety and create youthful noises. These little humans represent our future, and they're welcome fully in our meeting house. Now, we have a couple of announcements. Uh, Natalie, did you have one first? Hi, everybody. <laughs> uh, okay, that's better. So, um, coming up this next Sunday, RE and Social Events Together is hosting a play date for our entire congregation. So that means whoever you are, you're welcome. Um, we have lots planned. We're going to be, the kids are going to be making pancakes. And then, um, there's going to be Legos and games to play. We're also doing a collaborative art project. And the, um, it's, in, it's, it's centered around our, um, our mission statement. So, so we'll get to learn more about our mission statement. And um, our hope is that, so we're, we're going to have three play dates. We have one this month, two next month. And then at the end, we're going to install our um, art project and have it hanging on the walls. We're thinking down in Adams Hall. So there's a lot going on. It's going to be a lot of fun, and I hope to see all of you there. 
Um, oh, the first one is this January 27th. It's straight after the service. The other one's uh, February 10th and February 23rd. There's also a poster up on the RE bulletin board if you want it, more information. Okay. And bottle caps. Collect bottle caps. Libby, did you want to say something? Okay. Well, RE's got a lot going on. Bottle caps were mentioned. Well, as most of you know, the RE committee and the social justice committee are working with all of you to collect bottle caps, which will then be extruded into a bench for our playground. So please collect your bottle caps, put them downstairs in the red bin by the, the door to the meeting house. There, sure. We do take the caps from medicine containers. I just put a poster up in the red bin down there, which shows a bunch of the kinds of caps that we, can, uh, that we will take. If you have any questions about them, just talk to me. I'll be around. Uh, pretty much anything but metal, yes. Um, OK. The other thing is that besides collecting bottle caps, we also need to come up with some money. So one of the ways we're going to do that is we are making some little fabric bags for you to purchase to hang on your doorknob in your kitchen or wherever, just as a reminder, oh good, all the bottle caps go in here. And that will get set up next week. OK? Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Libby. Any other announcements? If not, I'll ask you to please check the order of service for other announcements about upcoming events. And if you haven't done so already, please take a moment to silence your cell phone. Thanks. Now, um, please join me in reading the Litany of Gathering, which is in your order of service on page three. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Injustice everywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. There are some things in our social system to which all of us ought to be maladjusted. Hatred and bitterness never cure the disease of fear. Only love can do that. We must evolve for all human conflict a method which rejects revenge, aggression, and retaliation. The foundation of such a foundation is love. Before it is too late, we must narrow the gaping chasm between our proclamations of peace and our lowly deeds which precipitate and perpetuate war. One day, we must come to see that peace is not merely a distant goal that we seek, but a means by which we arrive at the goal. We must pursue peaceful ends 
through peaceful means. You shall hew out of the mountain of despair a stone of hope. And today is a special day. We asked our new <coughs> members to get through this weather, and we're so proud that they did, and all of you did, to welcome them. So, Brett Hetrick and Eric Forite and Tim Ganaw, would you please come up front? Uh, we're going to be down there, but um, I'm just going to bring this to Brett. Brett, do you want to sign it on the table? Is that easy enough? All right, under Eric's name. So some of the signatures in this book um, look like we have a lot of doctors in our congregation because the signatures are very creative and unduplicatable which is very smart. So this is Tim. Tim joined um, uh, just a little while before Christmas, and uh, Tim has uh, attended the Ann Arbor Church, and so he's real familiar with um, Unitarian Universalism. Brett has been coming here for years, and he used to be a member of the choir, and he looks forward to that time again. Uh, yes? Tiny Tim. Oh, t <laughs> Tiny Tim. His, his brother was Tiny Tim in a play this year. Yeah, so there we go. <laughs> yeah, and Eric um, uh, has been coming for a few months, long enough to um, realize very excitedly, I, had, I should have saved this um, phone message. When he actually, he made the decision to join when he wasn't even here because he realized how much this community meant to him when he watch, was watching us on live stream and wanted to be here that Sunday and couldn't. So sometimes the realization comes in different ways. And so we welcome all three of you. And if the congregation would start with the words on page four and then the new members can join in. Okay, we, we welcome, welcome you to, to our, our congregation, congregation that, that follows a tradition of 500 years of the Unitarian Universalist history and puts into practice the principles of Unitarian Universalism. We acknowledge your choice to join with us in the life of a free-thinking religious community. I become a member of this congregation aware of the significant responsibilities of membership. I bring to my new community my talents and enthusiasm my shortcomings and my doubts. I ask you to direct me into opportunities of service. We, we are aware that you have not chosen an easy path in your spiritual journey. We are eager to share our congregation and include your strength and courage into our vision. We respect you, encourage you, we welcome you. We will walk with you as we continue on the shared spiritual journey together. May we be serving of the trust you instill in us, and may we be mutually affirming to one another. This morning, we renew our covenant of justice and love and action as we seek answers everywhere, include everyone, live with compassion. So I'm not trying to put you all on the spot, but I just wanted to give you an opportunity if you had anything that you wanted to share with the congregation, and it could be um, a one or two line joke, or it could be the warning that I give all the leadership in the congregation not to ask you to serve on too many committees all at once. So. Uh, are we doing our joy and sorrows later on? Um, you can give, you can start but, with uh, that. It's a little bit more than a sentence. So. That's all no, right. No, I love this church, and I've, uh, I, uh, I've known, you know, for the past 15 years, uh, I'm a recovering Catholic. Nothing against Catholicism. I love Catholic people. But uh, this church is home. Oh, that's so, great. Great. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I've been coming for a few months now, and I just, I enjoy coming here. So, yeah, yeah the call was a little abrupt, so. No, it was <laughs> joyful. I loved it. Uh, <laughs> 
I started coming here several years ago, and uh, uh, you know, I've been around the block a little bit. I worked for the uh, Religious Society of Friends, the Quakers, for about 17 years. Uh, I'm a Hindu myself, and uh, it was hard to find some place that I could participate in without feeling like odd man out. And since I've been going here, uh, I've found people to be warm, accepting, friendly, and very non-judgmental, and that's just what I need, and still do, and I hope that I can help this congregation uh, in their mission to just be inclusive. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, Brett. And Bill Keck is on our membership committee, and we can give him um, responsibility and blame for changing the colors and the kinds of name tags we have so that we can try and be just what Brett said, inclusive and welcoming. <laughs> oh, and Eric has one too. Welcome. Welcome. Okay. Good job. <laughs> So I would like to invite Natalie and all the kids to come up and you can help? Yeah, me too. Oh, all right. <laughs> Almost. <laughs> I got a crinkle over here. All right, everybody sit up on their bums, please. You got to sleep on your own time. No sleeping till this afternoon. And there's got to be room for everyone. So, and, oh, could everybody see me? That means you have to turn around. Unless you're like your mom and dad and you have eyes behind your head, which you might. So tomorrow is a very special day. And Unitarian Universalists and people actually all over the United States and somewhat all over the world celebrate a very special man's birthday. Does anybody know? Does anybody up here know who it is? Mm -hmm. Martin Luther King. And here's the next trick question. Does anybody know what is the most amazing phrase that he said that we say a lot, that you hear a lot? It starts with I. I had a dream. So he had a dream, and he had a dream that people, just what Brett said, that people all over the world would accept each other, and no matter what colors, what size, what belief systems they had, and he also had a dream that we would take care of each other peacefully. And so a lot of times that's what you all concentrate on in your religious education classes, because I know sometimes Natalie has to say, let's stop for a moment and say, how are we treating each other right now? And is it respectful? And if it is, you go on. And if not, sometimes you take a moment. So we have all kinds of people to take care of us. Sometimes it's people in the congregation. And sometimes it's brand new people, Natalie. Who would that be? Our new nursery care <laughs> Since about. Yeah, I've been here since I was one of you. So a lot of you are kind of familiar with me. And then I started like working here in like the summer, and then now I'm still here. And I'm finally introducing myself. <laughs> <laughs> she's, she's actually stepping up to a new role as the kindergarten lead teacher. So um, we're excited about that. She's going to do a great job. And then this is Megana. And she is, uh, she works in the nursery now. So if you have little ones, she's the one that's going to be leading them. And we have a lot of little um, babies coming back, um, and so we're very glad that you're here. And because you're brand new to Unitarian Universalism, you don't have to join officially, but here's an information packet for you. And there won't be a test unless somebody decides that they want to have a conversation with you um, during coffee hour. Yes? Um, I have a baby named Jana. 
You do. How old is your baby? You have to hold her still, don't you? Yeah. So Megana can help watch her. That's going to be great. She's like zero still, so she wears zero clothes. Size zero. Hopefully she doesn't run around with no clothes in the winter. So I'm going to give all of you a shaker, and all of you are going to look at the words on page five. And we're going to sing, We Are Marching in the Light of God. Some of you may choose to say, We Are Marching in the Light of Love. And this is a moving, grooving song, so I would ask you to stand as you are willing and able. And after you're done with your shakers, you can give it to Natalie. So people can have... Okay, here's a shaker for you. And let's see what else we have. Does this shake? This shake? Okay, wait, we're, we're going to shake. We're going we're gonna to make music together. Okay, yeah. All right. There we go. Oh, look at the little knobber fell off. Let's see what else I have. Here's a tambourine. Here's some bells. Natalie, I think the boy behind you doesn't have. Okay, we're more than ready, okay. Diane. Here's a couple other. Here you go. Here. Here. Okay, that's good. We are marching in the light of God. We are marching in the light of God. We are marching in the light of God.
Would you please join me in the words of offering that are listed on page five? We give generously to support this church where love, justice, and equality inspire our acts of service and compassion. We dedicate these gifts to all that we stand for within the Unitarian Universalist tradition. The perfect heart is the one that is shared. You are invited to come up front and share with us your first name and a joy or a sorrow as we gather in our hearts of perfection around your sharings.
A couple of days ago, um, not just Unitarian Universalist, but people in the literary world and actually all over the world lost a, a beautiful poet. Many of you um, have appreciated and loved Mary Oliver for years. She um, was at a Unitarian Universalist General Assembly, our annual big meeting one year, and um, read her poetry. So we were all fortunate to have her for those 83 years, and I'd like to open up the sermon with um, a tribute to the choir in her words and a tribute to all of us that become better and better singers the more that we do it. It may be the rock in the field is also a song, and it may be the ears of corn swelling under those green sleeves are also songs, and it may be the river glancing and leaning against the dark stone is also deliberate music. So I will write my poem, but I will leave room for the world. I will write my poem tenderly and simply, but I will leave room for the wind and the combing of the grass, for the feather falling on the goose fan tail and fluttering down like a song. And I will sing for the bones in my wrist supple, and I will, narr those narrow paths of my brain, the lightnings and the issues, its flags and its ideas, and the mystery of the number three. I will sing for the iron doors of the prison and for the broken doors of the poor and for the sorrow of the rich who are mistaken and lonely. And I will sing for the white dog forever tied up in the orchard. I will sing for this morning sun and its panels of pink and green on the quiet waters and for the loons passing over the house. I will sing for the spirit of Luke. I will sing for the ghost of Shelley. I will sing for the Janes and their careful brooms, and I will sing for salt and pepper in those little towers on my side table. I will sing for the rabbit that has crossed our yard in the moonlight, stopping twice to stamp the cold ground with his narrow foot. I will sing for the two coyotes who came at me with their strong teeth and then, at the last moment, began to smile. I will sing for the light that lifts and the veil that never lifts. I will sing for the veil that begins once in a lifetime, maybe to lift. I will also sing for the rent in the veil. I will sing for what is in front of the veil, the floating light. I will sing for what is behind the veil, light, light, and more light. This is the world and this is the work of the world. Rest in peace. In Unitarian Universalist circles, it is said that Martin Luther King may have been a prophet in our time. How we distinguish a prophet from any other person often takes the test of time through decades of litmus testing to see if the message is still relevant or merely just a cultural trend. Actually, in the end, it may be up to each of us as individuals to decide if standing with Martin Luther King's message is appropriate in our lives and how far we actually go with it. Each year, messages from Martin Luther King are heard around the country in liberal Christian Unitarian Universalist churches and in speeches given to continue to breathe energy into the legacy of this amazing man. The challenge on this day is to provide a message that is an all-year invitation and not to become complacent by its familiarity or by letting it become redundant. Today, therefore, I'm going to emphasize what it means to be woke from the dream. Martin Luther King's speech, I Have a Dream, has been probably used more prominently than any other phrase spoken in the English language. His dream had all the elements of creating a safe and just world for everyone. He was willing to both work and die for that dream 
to come to fruition. While many elements of the society that we live in have been improved over this lifetime in regards to prejudice and racism, we still have a long way to go. So what does it mean to be woke? Our English majors shudder with such use of grammar. And that is exactly where we begin. I think, it, is that Jude being woke? <laughs> I, th I see three, three capable adults handling um, that cry to respond to be, that was, that was perfect timing, right? <laughs> the shutter even went down to the religious education department. So to be woke instead of being awakened is just that. It wants to, it's a phrase that makes you want to think and rethink how we use language, what it means, what are we to be woke in to, what did it mean when we were asleep, what does it mean to have a dream and never to be woke from the dream. It means that when we look at what is happening around us, we use a scrutiny that allows us to move into an alignment with our own values, with our interpretation, and then changing our actions. It means that our, we, we are willing to have difficult conversations and not to settle for the easiest conclusion about sexism or racism or any of the other isms that we struggle with. It means that sometimes the message that you hear on Sunday will comfort the afflicted and afflict the comforted, and then give you fodder for thought and discussion and being the change agents that Martin Luther King would expect. Professor Kawai is a, a professor at the American Studies in Wesleyan University, and he said that racism is a structure, not an event. So this morning, a certain Catholic high school in Kentucky is apologizing after videos surrounding the students dressed in school garb confronted and mocked a group of Native Americans a couple yesterday, including one man believed to be a Vietnam vet in Washington, D.C. Several clips of this encounter have been circulating on social media. A small group of Native American drummers who were in Washington for the Indigenous People's March became surrounded by a much larger band of teenagers to be part of an anti-abortion protest. They had hats that said, thank you. I always, I can remember woke, but I can remember, not remember, make America great again. And there was a stare down contest with a young man um, who was Caucasian with a Native American that continued to drum. Continued to drum respectfully, and then when he was interviewed later, he said that he was hopeful that this young man would learn from the experience and change his behavior and his attitude. Racism is a structure. It's not just an event. It's us to us to dismantle it. A key point in looking at the structure of racism is to look at a point of view and the perspective from which a story is told, the narrative, if you will. It will be interesting to see and hear what the narrative describing these young white men, merely staring down Native American elder with their smiles, will sound like midweek. They didn't do anything overtly or physically violent. They might claim that they have freedom of speech because isn't that what we teach each other in liberal circles and our children, that you always have freedom of speech? And how dare us not complete the phrase, freedom of speech with responsibility? Because if you don't have responsibility when you have freedom of speech, it becomes weak and incomplete freedom of the pulpit, my opinion. <laughs> Another example of the importance of narratives is the story of when Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat on the bus 
as a protest to prejudice carried through by requiring blacks to sit in the back of the bus. But she was not the first African American to do so. Charges were filed against Claudette Colvin, a 15-year-old, nine months before Rosa Parks' action. The Montgomery, Alabama bus segregation laws were found unconstitutional based more on that 15-year-old's case than Rosa Parks' case. Yet the head of the NAACP wanted Rosa Parks' case to take center stage, thinking that that narrative featuring a child would take away the strength of the effectiveness of the bus boycott. There were plans in place here. Why is this important? Because the narrative, the way the story is told, slants us to think that the African-American Rosa Parks was the only one to take that action so publicly. The facts that Claudette Colvin was declared a ward of the state and permanently removed from her parents do not get remembered in this case. So the narrative of the boycott become one of the illegal boycott supported by a 26-year-old black minister troublemaker, Martin Luther King. Boycotting commercial services were illegal at the time. This is just one example of how the structures of the media and a spin on the story give many of us the white narrative of the boycott, if you will. Even in some of our households growing up, we heard that Martin Luther King was a troublemaker, stirring up the blacks, and it would not be good. Racism is a structure. It's not an event. It is up to us to dismantle it. And so to say that whiteness is a standpoint starts to trouble us, doesn't it? Because... We have left other churches and we have left relationships because no one is going to make us feel bad or guilty. We are the intellectual social justice elite as Unitarian Universalists. But as we hear in a, um, a, a workshop that talks about white fragility, Author Robin D'Angelo says, to say that whiteness is a standpoint is to say that a significant aspect of our white identity is to see ourselves as an individual, outside or innocent of any race problems. We're just human. This standpoint views many white people and their interests as central to and representative of humanity. And so what are we to do? We don't just sit and listen. We start asking questions now, and you're starting to ask questions. What is Leonetta doing up here today? Just where is this going to end? Isn't she the one that says this is a no-guilt church? Yes, it is. It's a no-guilt church, but we are questioning all the time, questioning our behavior and refining it. We don't just read and listen to one source of news or commentary. Our practice is questioning. In fact, for those of you that are new members and others, our unofficial symbol is the question mark. We know that to continue means that we have to upset some apple carts. It isn't going to be easy, it never is, and it's not going to be quick because change is going to stir up our assumptions. And so what happens when we look at how the narratives move through pieces that we don't create at all? We most often see this in the media. We see this in commercials. We are manipulated by the commercials in, in ways that we don't even know because they know how to um, get our attention. And then there's a message behind and a message in front of. I'm not going to distract us today, but maybe this will be a good sermon to give. Have any of you seen the new Gillette commercial? And it depicts males being tender and understanding 
and confronting each other and confronting the assumptions that we have had about males for eons to be something different and all the people in the commercial are males. And so keep your ears perked up when you go to the dentist, when you go to the family parties, because these conversations about the narrative will also come up. D'Angelo lists defensive behaviors that white people exhibit when challenging racial stress, gender stress, calling these responses white fragility, a phrase she began using several years ago. Now, some of you might remember that I gave a sermon on why I didn't want Unitarian Universalists calling themselves white supremacists. This was about 18 months ago. And as we perk with those words and sit with those concepts, sometimes we make a shift. I still don't like the term white supremacist. I don't want it to be used on any of you or myself. But even for us to be able to have that conversation and to be able to make a decision that we are not part of white supremacy is part of our white fragility. That we get to call, we get to call the marks. We get to call the marks on how the conversation is held and if it upsets us or not. And if you make us feel guilty, then we're out of the conversation or sometimes even out of the relationship so what would that do for me at Thanksgiving and Christmas dinner when my, just about my entire family voted differently than me? So I don't know, does anybody make a good tofu turkey that I could attend next Thanksgiving with you? If I decide to cut off everyone that thinks differently than I do? And so what are our responses to reinstate our equilibrium when we are presented with this challenge of saying that we live in a world with white fragility? Do we return to a comfort zone saying, well, you know, and, and it is amazing that we show up at the marches. Some of you have seen some of our church members on Facebook. They're in Washington, and they're resisting in the biggest way, and they're representing for us. And some people showed up yesterday at marches here in Detroit. And some of you have been doing the work for the last two and a half years, the work that needs to be done. And some of you aren't comfortable with what you see on a daily basis and you do what you can to work against the dominance within the racial hierarchy in our culture. So how can you be a white progressive and still have white fragility? You can, because this isn't a binary world anymore. And you're gonna hear words like that that are gonna test people like myself that really don't do numbers all that well. Binary, hmm, okay, two, yeah, okay, all right. So it's not one or the other. So we're not good or just, we're not good or bad because that's a binary system. We're works in progress because we're questioning. We've done the work, we did the, some of you did the work 60 years ago, you did the work, and you continue to do the work. And so, no guilt. Move it from here and the defensive to up here and to your feet. So, the binaries of your body, in your mind and in your feet. Change your actions based on what your mind goes through. D'Angelo suggests that we use our own racial discomfort as a door to greater understanding by asking ourselves some questions. And in the workshop that um, is spelled out by the UUA on white fragility, it says, why does this unsettle me? What would it mean to me if this information is true? How does my lens change my understanding of racial dynamics? How can my unease help reveal the unexamined assumptions you are not done yet, I have been making. Unless you're 105, you are not perked and finished yet. Is it possible that because I am white, there are some racial dynamics that I don't see? Am I willing to consider possibilities? And if I'm not willing to do it, then why not? And some of you might say, not. And some of you might say, Leonetta, what are you asking us to do? 
to reflect and think and reposition yourself and to be aware. Tim Wise, author of White Like Me, says the irony of American history is the tendency for good white Americans to presume racial innocence and ignorance of how we are shaped racially is the first sign of privilege. In other words, it is a privilege to ignore the consequences of race in America. James Baldwin, a novelist and social critic, wrote in his book, Nobody Knows My Name, More Notes of a Native Son. He says that any real change applies to the breakup of the world as one has only known it and the loss that gave in to one's identity and the end of safety. So this doesn't always feel good. And at such a moment, unable to see and not daring, but to imagine what the future will bring forth. Can you imagine, think for a moment, back to when you were five, and you might have been in a group of children did you know the history and did you know the important people that were on the news? And did you know what these children know today? For most of us, that would be no. And so we have done good work and now it's up to us to cradle these children to the next step with all of their knowledge so that they can move into actions and to continue to ask questions, even if it means getting in trouble at school by asking too many questions. Because why? Racism is a structure, and it's not an event. And it's up to us not to build walls, but to dismantle them. And so Robin D'Angelo, of course, I would recommend White Fragility. Why is it so hard for people, white people, to talk about racism. Sometimes it's very hard for white people to talk about racism if you're talking to an African American person because they're tired of doing all of our work. And so sometimes you'll have a group and you'll have, you know, some African American friends and you think that they should come to, you know, your discussion group. This is our work to do. This is our work to do without guilt. Guilt just just slows you down. Guilt, guilt just moves you into a place, well, I'm guilty. Then you have to get defensive and you have to list all these wonderful things you did or I have to confess the kind of household that I was raised in and luckily evolved away from. And it is a sad, sad story, some of the beliefs that I heard in my household. And I still have shame, if you will, about that. How can we have shame over a household that we were living in because those were our parents, and they catapulted us into this place of education and safe experiences so we could evolve and change our minds. So what does real change imply? It implies the breakup of the world as we have always known it. The breakup of the world, and then moving into faith communities, and moving into faith commitments is where you find yourself as Unitarian Universalist. This is a tradition about transformation. It's about a vision for a world made whole. And so this is a place where we can look at what the dominant culture holds, reflect on those ideologies, and then decide what our religion looks like. Yes, our religion, it means to bind together thoughts, don't be afraid of the word religion. It'll be okay. And so we rephrase ideas, and we rephrase them like this. Our religious institutions are embedded in the dominant culture and reflect a certain kind of ideology that some people would say is white supremacist because the power rest within the system, it's not an event, within the system of where we came from. And if you look at Unitarian Universalist history, you can go all the way back 500 years. 
They weren't totally white, but they were European white, so that was pretty close. And those were the systems that created how we operate with congregational polity, et cetera, today. But we can talk honestly about how we do things a little differently. So can you imagine at a board meeting, instead of just lighting the chalice, we might share the talking stick when it's time to talk. And we might make a little noise like the children do. It might be the rain stick, and each time we would move it. And why would we move that? Because uh, that means that there's a pause and it's giving respect for people to think and then put it in the middle and then it's taken up again and we don't use Native American rituals without understanding what we are borrowing and why. And so we implement different ideas and ways of being in our leadership and amongst each other so that we can dismantle what doesn't make sense in our culture anymore. Each of you has your own story. We know that people are in different places coming to terms with new knowledge. And I said this would be fodder for coffee hour and more. When we address these ideas of white fragility through prejudice and institutionalized racism, we will, we will not fall into the chasm of guilt. Be a good person. Sometimes be a bad person. Sometimes be an in-between person. Sometimes don't even judge yourself with a label. Just be. Apply it here. Be change agents. Apply it in your relationships. There is a curious dissatisfaction that we pick up on sometimes and we cannot let go of. So white righteousness, when afflicting, inflicting pain on African Americans is evident in the glee of a white collective derives from blackface, remember innocent Megan Kelly, and depictions of blacks as apes and gorillas, remember innocent Roseanne Barr who was a victim of her own medication. And so what do we say in circles? When people say, you've all heard this phrase, oh, people are just too sensitive lately. If you read a little bit more about Megyn Kelly's resume and her repertoire of how she chooses to speak to people, she asked Jane Fonda in the middle of a um, conversation with Robert Redford about their new television program or Netflix series, she asked her about her plastic surgery. So sometimes the commentator that looks all pure and lovely and refined stumbles over and over and over again. And what do we do in white institutionalized racism? We pay her more. That's what we do. Instead of saying, why is this person that's unqualified to do anything other than stir it up sideways, given all of this trust and then rewarded and compensated in such a way? So this is where we are. W. Ben Hunt's words say, this is the blessing I'm wrestling with on these issues to connect me with free thinking and truth think, think, let me start again, truth seeking human beings from all over the world and from every walk of life who are wrestling with this basic question. How do we make our way in a fallen world without losing ourselves in the process? And unlike the temper and the temple of what I have created. You do it through love, joy, and singing. All of you know how to access that. So if you've got nothing else from today, you got this, I hope. No guilt. Worry, too, is another one. No worry. Move into action with love, singing, and joy. So may you take the quietness of this room and use it as energy 
to move out into the joy of your life and joy in our lives and Unitarian Universalist word also means justice. May you have the strength um, to do just that. I am challenged weekly in conversations with people as to whether just let them talk or join the conversation and change the direction from that to hmm. May you have, may you have that great challenge and energy to meet it. And so our closing hymn is going to be two verses from Lift Every Voice and Sing. Many of you um, that have been here for over six years know that uh, when I was uh, visiting the church, uh, the schools in Chicago when we lived there, uh, I would go and talk to the kids about world religions. And the kids in, um, in the inner city of Chicago, they would stand up and sing this song every morning as their national anthem. And I'm sure that you've um, uh, heard it, or now that you will sing it, you'll hear it again. Please stand as you are willing and able. 149. I get that kind of energy and I think I have to repeat what I said last year in case some of you weren't here last year and this is the point that just came to me in the middle of that hymn is that Martin Luther King loved Unitarian Universalism he loved the idea of our faith being in such alignment with values um, that reflected justice and democratic approaches and I don't think he would have even accused us of being white institutionalized racist or white supremacist. In fact, he thought about converting to become a Unitarian Universalist. And some of you remember this point from last year. This is from Reverend Rosemary Blatt, and this really surprised me. The reason, and this is what I want all of us to think about, the reason that he did not convert to Unitarian Universalism is because he thought he would have a very difficult time of selling to the people in the African American community that were liberal Christians or Christians and Baptists, etc., that we would be accepting to that theology. So there it is. 
more to think about. Next time I preach, I will hope it's going to be happy, happy, joy, joy. <laughs> but just think, all your synapses are rolling and moving for Diana's post-loop. Thank you. Thank you.